All right, so this next talk, we're going to talk about actually connecting to AWS IoT Core, specifically around the certificates and managing those. Okay, so let's first talk about IoT Core. It's a suite, as we said, of AWS services. Um, there, one thing that you're going to do in there primarily is you're going to register your different IoT devices. They call them things. So there's literally a menu called things, and you click on it, and you add a thing. Um, they then expect you to configure them with a certificate. So you're going to set up a, a TLS, basically a security certificate with a key pair. And then, as I said in the beginning talk, and Don alluded to as well, that certificate is going to identify what your device is in the thing network that you're building. He also mentioned security policies a little bit. So the security policy is attached to the certificate that identifies the thing. So that's the deal. You can make up policies and attach them to one or more certificates. Right? So you might have a policy that says, I can talk on this particular topic. Great. Add it to the certificates that need it. From there, you can define rules. So Amazon has um, IAM rules, uh, the users and groups rules that it has. And there's a special uh, set of rules for IoT that you can wire up. So for example, when a message comes in, you can then deliver it to Kinesis or what have you. So that's another thing you can do from here as well. Another thing that it does is it associates your device with a thing called a device shadow. And Steve will talk a bit about that. Um, and that's about managing, yeah, that's Steve in the back that looked and says it me. Uh, <laughs> so the device shadow is a piece of state that can be uh, held and shadowed on AWS to keep a crack of state and then sent down to the device and updated from the device. So data, for example, readings or configuration settings and things like that. And of course, as Don mentioned earlier, it has a broker that one of the protocols it talks is MQTT, and MQTT can use certificates to identify the device that communicates in. It can also do HTTP and web sockets with MQTT. There's a bunch of different protocols you can use. And for each of those, you can support encryption to communicate with them through these certificates. So, the thing registry is going to want to have you set up each individual thing. Now, you may have a single thing to wire at a time. So in that case, you can click on register a single thing and you walk through the steps. You can also do this from the command line or through the API. So the CLI, the Amazon command line interface, can do this. You can also program it. But in terms of the console here, the web console, you can do it from here as a single device. Or if you have a bunch of certificates you've set up already for a bunch of devices to onboard, you can set up a JSON document describing where they are in an Amazon S3 bucket. And it tells, OK, here's all the devices, here's their certificates, and here's what they're identified as, their thing name, and so on. So you can do it in bulk as well. So when you add your device uh, to the thing registry, you're going to have a device ID. Now, I'm kind of going back out of sequence a little bit here. Eh, maybe not. But one thing you're going to do is you're going to sign a certificate. And then that certificate's going to have a common name in it, like all these certificates do for X509. And the common name in our example we're using here, we're taking the device's internal ID for itself. And we're using that as our kind of our particular way of doing the naming of these devices. The easy thing is the name's already defined for you. So we're just going to assume that the device ID, which we can get off the device and ask it in the Arduino toolkit, we can say, what's your client ID or device ID? That's what that is there. And so then Amazon refers to it by that name as its primary identifier. There's also all sorts of metadata you have. You can assign a, a type to your thing. So if this is like a, a household automation thing, it could be a light bulb or a shades or blinds. Or if these are different particular sensor applications, you can say, these are my temperature and pressure reading devices. So you can set up different types. You can then put them in groups. You can put tags on them. All the common things that Amazon lets you do to track things. Now, in IoT Core, there's a number of ways to communicate with it. Primarily, the devices are going to use X509 certificates because that's the easiest way to identify what the device is. In that negotiation, it says, here's who I am. And it says, OK, I'm going to look at that certificate. Do I know about it? And what's it associated with? So that's what we're going to use in this series of, of discussions. 
You can also, from a programming perspective, if you're writing lambdas or whatever, and you want to configure and communicate with the server, well, you have the option of using standard um, users and roles. You have the uh, possibility of connecting in through LDAP, through Cognito, which is their security system, um, and doing that from a mobile client. But for the IoT devices themselves, we're going to use X509 certificates. Back to this diagram here. And sometimes uh, the uh, asynchronous, or what is it, the asymmetrical keys, PKI, these keys are a little bit confusing to people. So the thing is, there actually are two sets of certificates involved here. Amazon itself on the server side has its own certificate signed by itself because they're a certificate authority saying, I'm Amazon and I'm allowing things to talk with me. Your thing will generate a private key or something will generate a private key and public key assigning request and get it signed. So there's going to be a private key stored on the physical device. There's going to be a client certificate that it's going to send up. But there's also going to be a copy of that client certificate up on Amazon to say, oh, yeah, I know what that thing is. And when they handshake, not to get too deep in the technicals because we have 20 minutes, um, when they handshake to communicate and they do all the back and forth, you know, hello, I'm here. Yes, I see you. Here's some key I'm going to make up with you. And we now agree on some sort of encryption protocol. We're going to be exchanging those keys and making sure that they're proper. Your message is signed with the public key and the certificate was created using the private key and a signing request. So it knows, oh, okay, that public key was signed by that private key. Therefore, I know that this is encrypted properly. That's basically it. You can tell MQTT to encrypt with 509 certificates. You basically say, I want to use secured MQTT. And by the way, here's my client certificate. And that's what we're going to do in the lab in the afternoon. And again, make sure each device has its own key pair and its own client certificate. Because if you don't do that, then every device looks like the same device from an encryption perspective. And you can't easily take advantage of saying this certificate matches this device in Amazon. You'd have to come up with some other mechanism that could be spoofed or hacked with, potentially. Especially if you're putting in a message and saying, I'm me. Well, if anything could grab the key, anything could say, I'm this device. But if every device has its own key that only it had private key to generate, then there's nothing else that can fake who you are. All right, how do we generate these key uh, certificates, I should say, from our keys? Well, so one option is you can click on a button. Now, of course, Amazon's going to make this easy. I want to click a button to get a key pair and a cert. OK, Amazon knows your private key, right? And Amazon did everything for you. So now you've got to install the private key on your client. And you know Amazon knew about it. So that's one way of doing it. And it also makes it easy for you to just kind of lazily use one key. But it's an easy thing to do. It's good for prototyping and hacking around. Just make sure you give different certificates to each device. Some devices, like the one we're using today in the lab, have an encryption chip on them that can generate a public and private key pair. And the key pair can be locked to that device so only that device can see it. You can certainly overwrite it with a new one, but you can't retrieve it in an unauthorized way. It's locked in. So that's the mechanism we're recommending in, in our lab today as, as a one pretty secure way of doing it. Only that chip can really get that private key and use it to encrypt traffic signed by the public key. All the server needs to know is what your certificate is. right? So it needs a request to sign it. It signs the certificate, and now your client can send messages, and it can verify that, yes, this private and public key pair are what is used to encrypt this traffic properly. And also you have the option of using, if you already have infrastructure in your company and they give you all this stuff, you can certainly load up their root certificate on the server. You know, you can, you can load up the key pair and all that stuff that they give you and the certificate for the client. If you already have an infrastructure, it's going to do it for you. All those things are possible. Here's an example, and we're going to do this in the lab. The particular chip we have is an ECC, I think it's 608 or 508 chip. It's an encryption chip. And it's a specialized chip that you can communicate with through a CAPI. 
So there's a little program you can run to run a, a generation of a key. You say what key you want to use. There's five slots on that chip for five private keys. So you say, I want to use slot zero. That's the private key I want to generate. Go generate me a private key and ask me for a certificate signing request. So what it's going to do is walk through the steps like you do when you're creating an SSL domain name, right? And it's the same stuff you would normally do. They want to know all sorts of organizational information. The only thing that really matters is the common name. That common name is the client ID in, in IoT. So when you communicate with MQTT and you tell it, here's my encryption, part of your key that gets sent up is that common name, and that can be associated with you. And because it's built into the certificate, it can't be spoofed, because once the certificate is signed, that's a valid cert with that common name in it. So stepwise, we went through, we basically skipped most of the questions. We got to the common name. And by default, it actually does bring up in, in this particular board, it brings up the ID of the client device. And you can just accept that as the default. And now the common name will be the device's ID. Then it tells you that you need to select a slot, which part of the, of the chip do you want to hold it in. There's, as I said, five different slots, five different private keys you can generate on that particular chip. And then if you pick that slot, you can either use the existing key or generate a new one. Probably want to generate a new one to overwrite the old one that's, that's there. So now you've got a locked private key, and you've got a certificate signing request based on that public key associated with a private key. The public keys are transferred around. The private keys live where the device encrypts the message. You take that request and something signs it to give you a certificate. All right, in our case, it's gonna be Amazon. You'll see in another slide. Side note, you could do the same thing if you wanted by hand with OpenSSL, right? There's OpenSSL, command line SSL API. Then you can basically say, give me a new request, give me this particular key. Uh, I wanna build a signing request, so send that to CSR. Right, so first you generate the key, then you generate the signing request, and then you basically send this one up to your certificate authority to sign it. Either way, whether you have the board do it or you do it through a command line tool or API or system you have, now you've got a CSR, a request to generate a certificate. All right, so now we create a certificate based on the CSR. In the IoT core panels, when you're looking at a particular certificate, you can now associate it with, a, with, I'm sorry, looking for a particular thing, device, you can attach a certificate to it. One way to do it is to use a certificate you already have. That's in the case where we're using OpenSSL. We send it off to like, you know, GoDaddy or Let's Encrypt. But we're going to do it by creating with a CSR. We have a, a signing request. We're going to upload the request to Amazon, and it's going to let us download the created certificate. So there's a button to upload it. I've already done that there. And then you click Upload File. You choose File, Upload File. Then, if we're looking at a particular device, so this is kind of the view in the IoT core panel. Looking at a particular device, there's the certificates that have been loaded for that device. There's one in this example. If you click on that certificate, you then get the details. And it's kind of hidden. But this is basically outlining all the keys in the certificate. In there somewhere is the common name. There it is, Ripple device. Um, in my example, I have a dummy name, but it probably would be the ID. Uh, and the bottom line is you can click a little drop down actions panel and download the certificate. And the certificate looks like your typical X509 certificate. That is representing the signed certificate request that was created by a private key that was sent through a public key, right? So all that stuff together turned into a valid certificate that I can now send up for my client saying, I'm me. And Amazon knows that it has a copy of that same certificate. So it can say, we're associated, so this is safe. All right, so that was the case where you let Amazon sign the CSR. The other option is you use your certificate, so you're going to upload the certificate that you've already had signed by something else. 
And the only trick there is, if it's not a well-known root, like Let's Encrypt or whatever, you may have to load its certificate chain as well, which is a standard thing you do if you're adding a root certificate that's not well-known, like your own company's root certificate. So that kind of stuff happens too if you have to go down that road. All right. And we already talked about policy, so I won't take too much time with this. But basically, once you have your thing assigned to a cert, you then define one or more policies that are attached to it that let it do things. Right? So as we talked about, and I think Don covered this pretty well, um, you, know, you can tell it you're allowed to, to publish, subscribe, you know, get messages from the queue, connect. When I was playing around with this initially, I didn't have the connect privilege. Guess what couldn't happen for me? Anything. If you can't connect to IoT Core, you can't send messages through IoT Core. And it was a little vague about what was going on until I added, added the connect option. Policies themselves can be shared across many different devices because of the wildcards that Don mentioned. I think he might have talked about this. But for example, let me just zoom in here a little bit. This is under the secure menu on IoT Core policies. You can create a policy, and the policy could have something in it like that. So this is the connect, I don't know if you can see on the left there, but this is the connect policy. This is saying, fine, I'll let you connect, and I'm going to use the client slash common name. So this is the common name attached to the certificate. And then down here, I'm going to only let you publish in the... <laughs> One moment, please. Don't zoom when you don't have your zoom just right. That's the lesson there. There. There, that'll be a little better. Sorry, folks. So we're allowing publish and receive on that broker there, and I've kind of blocked out part of the client, uh, the company ID there, topic, things, and my client. So I can only publish messages based on the name of my client that I've assigned when I created the certificate and associated it with the device. So that's kind of a little example of the policies. You'll get practice with this later, but the bottom line is you do have to attach the policies, especially connecting and at least publish or subscribe, or you're not getting anywhere with Core IoT. And then you just go in, you attach a policy to the cert. So remember, the cert is attached to a device, and then you attach policies to the cert. And you can search, pick one, create one, I think, in there, too, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's representing the, the, sorry, the signed key, like a hash for the key. And then you can search up and add the policies. And then you communicate. All right, so then that will all depend on what you're programming, right? So if you're programming in Arduino, you would pick an MQTT client library, an SSL library to do the encryption, Etc. and Wi-Fi library, and you would write that. And we have sketches that we're going to use in Arduino to do all that stuff for people staying for the lab, and I'm sure we'll, we'll put that up on GitHub for everyone to look at later. All right, any questions? Yeah. So the process that you showed, there are a lot of screens you like. Yeah. Like download. What happens when I want to download a thousand devices? So the, the question was, there's a lot of screens there, right? There were a lot of screens to look at, and we were going through a lot of steps. What happens when you have 1,000 devices to manage? There's that bulk registration process. So you can feed it a JSON document and get information back to deal with those signed uh, certificates. So I have a link in here for that. You can take a look at the bulk policy. But there's a way programmatically to do it, so you don't have to do that manually in a crazy way. So I get those downloaded. Now, in my production line, I have to set it up where I preload each device. Yeah, that's a good question. So when you get those downloaded, now you have to configure each device. And that's kind of out of my scope more, but um, you will have some sort of provisioning you need to do. Uh, Amazon does have kind of like an auto-provisioning feature you can use. I haven't really looked into it myself. But you can, when you can connect up, you can get provisioned. And I would assume that you have something that would be, you know, attached the right way for them to associate with each other, probably the client ID, to then download information. So maybe someone else in our group can talk about that later. Yeah. Um, we do that. We buy the crypto chips from microchip with our device certs already on them. And then we take our signer certificates that we signed all our devices with and register those on Amazon. Okay. Thank you.